Okay, let's all try to remember who the real enemy is. Hello, fellow book nerds, this is Gabby, and today I want to talk to you about the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes movie adaptation of Suzanne Collins' book, which I think came out like 2020. So we've been waiting for a while. I've been anticipating this movie really eagerly. When I first read the book, I was really curious if they're gonna make an adaptation, what it's gonna be like, and I had a lot of thoughts and feelings. Um, so let's get into the movie. I just saw it yesterday, so all these thoughts are very fresh. I did only see it once, so hopefully they're quite accurate. Let's start with a little bit without spoilers, and then we can get into like actual scenes. But let's go into my history of songbirds and snakes, what I thought about the movie, and let's rank, rank them all. Let's do it. So I actually read The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes when it just came out. I have a vlog where I read the whole thing, just like the week it came out. And I've not watched that video back, but I know that my feelings were like positive, but not like overtly so. Like, you know, it was really early days when we had absolutely no idea what to expect. We just knew it was about young President Snow and, you know, your imagination co can go anywhere with that. So I think the first time I read the book, there was so much baggage, so much expectations, and I didn't like properly appreciate it, I don't think. But I have since reread the whole Hunger Games series. I've reread the, uh, ballad, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes again. And I think it's brilliant. The book is just so good. I think if you take it and read it and look at what it has to say, it's just really amazing villain origin story. So let's chat about the movie. I will say, I don't think I had, I have notes. Like, I have notes because, you know, we all will always have like our favorite scene that didn't make it or whatever. But like, I have no notes. They did the best they could. I think the biggest drawback, I guess, of the movie is that it's already quite long, but it had to be that long and already so much had to be cut out. So the only way not to cut out so much was to make you make it maybe two movies and separate it. But as a one single movie, they decided to go with that route. I honestly think they did the absolute best they could. They translated the spirit of the novel so well and I think that's what's most important with adaptations is it does it have the spirit. It's um, you know it's natural you're gonna lose some of your favorite scenes, some of the lines in the book won't make it, there'll be small changes to simplify and tighten up the timeline because books are very different medium to movies and I think especially with Suzanne Collins books and like Hunger Games series as well as the prequel there's so much internal monologue and so much richness in the internal lives of the characters. We get so much of Katniss's internal thoughts that really makes you get to know her as a character. But she's a different character if you were just looking at her actions versus her motivations. Like in the book, you can really examine that. And I think that was very similar for the movie because we are in Snow's head uh, and we learn a lot about him, his perspective on the world, and I think his turn to the villain is nowhere near as shocking if you know what he's thinking, even if he's doing something kind, what are his internal thoughts? And he's not born pure evil, and I think something you really get in the book and the movie is that you really get a lot of sympathy. So yeah, overall, I just thought the movie was executed brilliantly. I think the performances were probably one of the strongest parts and secondly the, the second strongest would be the costumes and the uh, set design so the performances i think everyone completely like blew it out of the out of the water it was amazing tom bliff as president snow i don't like snow because he's not a great person but i love tom bliff he seems like such a nice guy he's a really good actor i think the way he was able to portray the shifts and the internal thoughts and the conflict and the trauma of this character and at the same time made us believe that he could grow up to be the present snow we know if 75 years have passed he's done such a brilliant job love him i really love rachel zegler as uh, lucy gray i think she's done a brilliant job she's got an amazing voice i think she really carried the 
the singing portions because I was a bit worried because there's so much singing in this book, like a lot. And I don't really like that in books when there's like lots of songs um, because, you know, you just kind of read them as poems, I guess. The, you, you, you can imagine a melody, I guess, if you're very musical. I'm not. So to me, I was always like, oh, another song. But when she was performing them, I was feeling it. The, the team that wrote the music and uh, the arrangements for the songs absolutely amazing job and again Rachel's got an amazing voice I mean that was already established from her work on West Side Story but yeah she just carried the song so well I think she gave a lot of depth to Lucy Gray and I think that you really know that she understood her character having watched all the interviews and stuff like that you you really can say that she understood what, what the core of Lucy Gray was. And Lucy Gray is such an enigmatic character because you constantly question her motives. And I think it's still a little ambiguous and that was portrayed really well in the movie. I do have a slight complaint I wanna get to because uh, I do feel like maybe they softened the ages of Lucy Gray quite a bit. I really loved Sejanus. Sejanus is a character that I always felt bad for, understood, but I was never like, an absolute favorite of mine because he's just so damn honorable that it got like annoying at points because you're like boy some self-preservation instinct please the actor josh i believe his name is it did a really good job it's really funny that he's rachel's like loose boyfriend and all the uh, red carpets are quite funny because it's like the trio of them and tom sometimes is a little bit of a third wheel but i just think it's all cute and he did a really great job and i think portrayal of Snow and Sage and Sage Janus's relationship was really amazing and Dr. Gall, Viola Davis, oh my god, like she's just, I mean I, I knew that she was amazing but she's just like so amazing so all of the performances, absolutely no complaints. Already took off my um my lipstick but I just wanted to say, Lucky Flickerman, a joy, that man, so so out of touch, so funny. Loved every second of him. <laughs> it was it was ridiculous and I loved it. Tigress, really loved Tigress. Her soft voice, there's just something so soothing about it. Like I said, the other really amazing part would be the set design and the costumes. I, from the opening scene, which was intense and we can talk about that in a moment, but from the opening scene, just the way they realized the capital and then the District 12, and then Arena. It was just amazing. It was like straight out of the book. I do think that I I felt like, oh, why didn't they keep to the whole stadium, like a football stadium being um, the, the arena, but I think it actually worked really well. Maybe it would have been quite hard to pull off with the stadium, so they did like a different type of arena for entertainment, and I think it worked well. I just felt like they really, I believed that this capital will become the capital that it is in 65 years. It, you could see the building and how it's rebuilding itself, but then you could see like Snow's apartment, which um, you just pan out and there's just a room that's like half collapsed and they just live there because what other choice do they have? And you could see how much opulence that is, but also how people are still traumatized from the war. And I think the costumes were really eye-catching and amazing. I think District 12, like Lucy served all the outfits, especially when she was like out of the arena and she had more than one costume. I think that was really done well. I like that they let the tributes be grimy and gross because they're kept in really terrible conditions. So I really love that they did that. And overall, just it felt so lived in and so real. And you really felt the horrors of the war and how that impacted people here. Dr. Gall's laboratory, I think was done so well. Like it was really weirdly like spacious and white, but then it had all these horrific things in it. I think all of that was just done so, 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 so well. So I love the movie. I think if you have read the book, you will also really like the movie because if you've read the book and liked the book, you will also like the movie because it's such a faithful adaptation. Like I said, the spirit is all there. They made some changes. We're going to talk about it, but they were, none of them were big enough to betray what the story was. And I really appreciate that because that's a hard line to tell and it's hard to say to tell a origin story of a villain and tell it so effectively so i think that's it for the no spoiler no spoiler section if you've not read the book and you've not seen the movie go check it out let's talk about spoilers what i like that they changed what i didn't like details 
I guess we can kind of talk chat about changes that and what I thought about them. Some of them I think were good, some weren't. Um, I just overall, again, just want to say how good this was. There was so much attention to detail and I really appreciate that in an adaptation because it just makes you feel like people who made it really care. Like, for example, again, I already mentioned this, but the fact that the tributes were like even Lucy Gray, she looked really sweaty and gross when she got off the train and that's how she was meant to look because they're being treated like animals and that's the point. And I liked smaller details like the fact that Lucy Gray, when she comes out of the arena and she's performing for the first time, pretty sure she's wearing a snake bracelet, which is just such a small like thing, but it just makes you really feel like they, they really brought it through and you know her design on her dress being primrose and Katniss I love that I love that the snow he starts off in this red like color like very bright red uniform and at the end of the book he wears them uh, at the end of the movie he wears the maroon suit and it just calls back so much to his suits when he's the president it shows the corruption of him and how he changes I love the hair and how that played a role because it was you know those pretty like pretty boyish curls in the beginning obviously he shaves it off but then when it grows back it grows like he styles it differently it's way more straighter it's very like rigid and it feels way it, do, it feels adult it doesn't feel childish anymore it feels very controlled if that makes sense and that's kind of how snow's transformation goes i think majority of the changes come from the fact that the movie had to be so efficient with its time and I do feel like they focus more on the first part of the book because that's where you set up the characters, that's where you set up the world, that's why you make them people understand and that means that I feel like the last bit, the peacekeeper, was a little bit more rushed and we really like had to get through it quickly. There was a lot of time spent in the arena but they still like really condensed it. But at the same time the movie was just so good with the time it had. It it like really wasted no time because like opening shots are Coralinus and Tigris running through the capital scavenging for food in Dunsters while um, Liv's dad, whatever his name was, uh, cuts off a woman's leg to eat it and I'm like wow so we're just straight into cannibalism, straight into it and I like that they set all of that up and they made you feel how desperate it was again it just shows so well the destruction i mean in the book snow thinks a lot about what it was like during the war what the consequences were it's not right but you understand why someone might be so traumatized and never want to go back to that place that they think that the games being a dictator will make the world safer because it's like all that control means that people are not brought down to their base instinct but you know obviously snow never thinks about he, like in the in the capital they don't think about district people as people so he doesn't think oh wait but do the districts actually have it as bad as we did in the war almost uh he doesn't think like that but he cares about his capital people being well and himself primarily he's quite self-centered and self-motivated in that way to provide better for himself. There's just a couple changes that I'm like, I feel like they were important and it's kind of a shame. Um, for example, Clem, I think they did a the first bit quite well, although they did my girl really dirty because I didn't like Clem in a book, but still like um, in a book, it was like a group assignment they were meant to do as a group. She didn't like insert herself to do this and they steal all the credit for Snow's work. And Dr. Gold doesn't tell her, hey, reach into here. And if it's not you that wrote it, you're gonna be bitten. Like, my girl didn't know. So she just like went in and then Dr. Gold was saying it as her hand was already in the snake pit. And I feel like that really showed you that Dr. Gold is extremely ruthless. Like the punishment did in no way was warranted by the crime because all she really did was like take a bit of credit, but she didn't insert herself into the assignment. She didn't volunteer that she was the one that did the whole thing like it was really out of proportion and it shows you how ruthless and how dangerous Dr. Gall is and it also shows you that she's a trickster and she likes playing games and it's all kind of a, a game to her and in the movie because she already told Clem what would happen almost Clem getting in I guess it shows a different kind of thing which is fear because 
what are, what are my choices? I can't say no to this powerful person, so I'm just gonna put my hand in the snake pit where I know I'm gonna be bitten. They, we never hear back from Clem again. I do, I did really like her coming back and her connecting with Snow and forgiving him and all of that. It just like her having the scale, scales and stuff and molding and like showing how bad the impact was. And overall, I really did miss like all the relationship building between Snow and his capital friends because they've known each other since birth and they've all and they even if they're not his closest friends he still knows them really well and he knows and they played together when they were, when they were kids and they like had a deeper connection I feel like and even if they're not his best friends you, you do have a feeling that he belongs in this world he is well wildly respected he's so charming i think that's another thing that maybe i understand why it was it had to be condensed because otherwise it, it we would be there in the cinema for six hours something that i really liked in the book is how it showed that every person in authority or like an authority figure loved snow they just some somehow he ended up being taken under people's wings so much and it just shows you how people didn't see through to build him like Dean Highbottom was literally the only person in position of authority that wasn't like snow 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 it part of it was his name for sure but also he was so charming like when he was in district 12 the scientist there it wasn't Dr. Gall but somehow she'd be telling Dr. Snow all these facts and she's like help explain to him walking jays they're having conversations like she's kind of taking him under his wing same with the peacekeeper leader he was kind of like well I'm like i want to take care of you do this like you did done so well in this exam i'm very proud like he just felt ownership and people wanted to mentor him so bad same day he had not just dr gall in the capital but he had that one teacher that like was super advocating for him and I think that just really shows you how charming he was and how he could get whatever he wanted through his charms because that's all he has. He has nothing else going for him. He has his name, his charms, that's it. He has no money, no real status in that sense because he can't buy a wing. He can't even afford to go to university. He can barely afford to eat. And they did that part really well with him just like looking at the food being like, I am starving, but I'm not gonna eat this to look stupid. So I'm just gonna keep starving. All of that's to say is just that I wanted maybe to have at least one other authority figure, but I understand why Dr. Gall had to have all the roles almost and be the one that's like really guiding and mentoring him. And yeah, I think the loss of internal thoughts obviously was natural. It's a movie, it's gonna be different. Like Snow has some quite mean-spirited thinking from beginning, like when he thinks Tigress might have, you know, sold herself for the shirt and like when they were starving and she's he's kind of like, eh, why would you do that? But then she like saved him or like, what he thinks about his grandma was kind of like, look at this per per pathetic old lady singing this anthem. But outwardly, he's kind and he's warm. And even if he has these thoughts, he doesn't like act on them or anything. He doesn't like Sejanus or like, he thinks Sejanus is kind of an idiot, but he's going to be kind to him because he doesn't see the value in not being so, at least for now, because his dad is powerful and he can get something out of that relationship. But I think the only time where I wish they gave him some kind of monologue you know um it was in the end in a scene with lucy in the woods where she's escaped and in his little deranged head he's like actually lucy gray is not all that innocent she actually like killed a lot of people and she was gonna kill me so like it's okay that i kill her uh or like i should get rid of her because she's actually not so innocent and the way he just flipped that and i feel that could have been cool to see him trying to you know monologue to her like lucy gray you ain't no so innocent i know you killed all these people like you said we're both murderers like something like that could have really explained what was going through his head like tom Bliff did an amazing job portraying that when he was like on his knees and was like just went for something in his head but i think maybe hearing that a little bit would have been helpful to to understand it a bit better and that brings me to Lucy Gray, which I feel like they kind of took away some of her edges. Like I said, they really softened her because in the books, she's by no means like an evil mastermind killer that Snow is trying to pretend that she was to make himself feel better. Um, that's for sure. But she does like she's got an edge she is the one that wants to you know do the revenge embarrass the the do the uh, mayor's daughter by 
putting the snake down her um, dress, which she obviously does here as well. And her performance is like so spirited and people clap for her and people love her. She does a lot of flirting <laughs> before going into the arena, which I think was part of her plan to be like, this guy can help me, let me try to get him to help me. Within the arena, he gives her the compact, but he implies that she should do the rat poison but she is the one making the decision to put the rat poison in and then use it and she you know poisons the water leaves it somewhere and wavi dies and she, i think she kills like three tributes by um poisoning them but there was a lot more like defensiveness and like unwillingness at all to fight almost and it felt a little bit disingenuous like she was again i'm not saying she wasn't a good person i'm not saying snow is anyway right but she did she did what she had to survive she was a survivor and i think maybe here they were kind of like they, let's take those nasty pesky feelings away a little bit they did some of it so i can't complain like entirely so i think majority of the things where they changed something and i was like hmm, i don't know how i feel about that was at the end in the third part where he's the peacekeeper so when sejanus is um caught and hanged and they play the recording of the Jabber J with his confession. I feel like I wish they didn't do that because I feel like the one solace is that Sejanus didn't know that Snow was the one who betrayed him. And I kind of prefer that because my boy's already going through a lot and he's suffering a lot. So do we really need to tell him that his brother, the guy he thinks is like his one true friend, was the one who betrayed him, that feels unnecessary. Um, so I was like, oh, and then obviously that makes it like way more obvious for Lucy Gray because who else would Sejanus be telling his plan that has access to Jabber Jays and then could say, like, to me that was kind of like, okay, so Snow is definitely shifty. And, and it's definitely the beginning of the end, you know, for her to be like, huh, that's suspicious. And we can see earlier that Lucy Gray starts catching on that there's something dodgy going on with Snow because there's a scene where she tells him she wants to run away and he's like, I'm gonna run away with you. And he like touches her um, chin and I feel like she flinches away a little bit. So clearly she thought it was something like dodgy already going on. Whereas I think in the book, she truly, till he says, killing three people is enough for me that's when it really clicks and she starts doubting and putting all the pieces together because she gave him all of his trust like she promised she would and he did never trusted her even in the cabin where they're like also like some scenes were just like word for word like it was it was crazy how accurate they felt um but in the cabin she's the one that's like oh i'm gonna be the only loose end and i feel like that was almost like her putting the idea in his head whereas in a book, he did not need any help having ideas put into his head. So he, and he was like, but you wouldn't do that. And she's like, of course. But they like hesitated for such a long time. I'm like, girl, are you try what are you doing? <laughs> like, it just felt a little bit like she was like, yeah, I will betray you. So you should probably tie up this loose end. I'm like, um, um, then I also find like, it's such a small detail, but I really like in the book that he found out that he passed that captain's whatever exam and he was being moved to literally just as he was leaving to escape and i feel like for me in the book i was like holy shit that that is the beginning of the end well obviously the, i think the beginning of the end started way 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 earlier but that was the moment where i was like he ain't running away and nowhere i guess in the movie they kind of compensated for it by him saying you know it's all it's all Panem, doesn't matter where I am, if the guns are found, I'm gonna be killed. So it just makes it like more obvious that he would still have to go because of the guns, which maybe in the book is not so obvious because you're thinking, why don't you just take this opportunity to clearly you want to kind of thing. I quite like that in the book, it's like literally the last moment. Like I feel like if he never found out that he was transferred to two and he had that exam, he probably maybe would have even gone. And even if he found the guns i don't know if he would behave the same way maybe he would you know i'm not saying they would go off live happily ever after i'm just saying that i feel like that was the trigger that was the first when he was like oh i'm not i'm not escaping i'm gonna do whatever it takes to take this opportunity because that's my way home that's my ticket to greatness and power i quite like in the book that it's such a oh shit moment when he finds out literally as he's leaving it just felt very like oof then i also felt like 
um, just to like talk a little bit more about the, the ending. Obviously, he gets bitten by the snake, but in the book, the snake did was venomous. I don't know if he was like deathly venomous, but Snow starts exhibiting, like starts feeling woozy and stuff. Although later, mm, okay, I say that, but then, so so Snow snake Snow is bitten by a, by the snake and he starts feeling woozy and he feels like everything's a bit hazy and he's like Lucy Gray tried to kill me because she sunned the snake on me and then he comes back and they heal his wound and they're like actually I think there was no venom or something like oh it, you're fine it's probably just nerves and adrenaline so I guess in the book it's also implied that he thought that the venom was doing something but actually it was just him being paranoid and having like adrenaline rush um whereas in the movie he doesn't even feel like anything amiss so him being like well you're trying to kill me was maybe even slightly more exaggerated which obviously he's just looking for an excuse even in a book you know if it's just an adrenaline rush but you assume she's trying to kill you you know you're gonna be like oh well then i should kill her it's like that's my excuse so actually it's all right and then two little things was Dr. Gall, like the last scene with her, also again, Viola Davis, absolutely amazing. Uh, but that last scene where she, uh, you know, says, I hope you learned from your time in District 12, you've been pardoned, blah, blah. Like, I really wish they kept the line in the book when she's like, I hope you enjoyed your summer internship because you just realize, holy fuck, she like, she let Dean Highbottom expel him, send him to 12. And all of that is part of her sick little lesson. Like, when I read that for the first time, I was like, did you mean summer internship, girl? A change that I did like, uh, and I thought was really good one, was Tigress and kind of her relationship towards Snow. Because um, you can see throughout the whole movie, she calls him Corio, and he's her little cousin, and she's like, there. I love the relationship. Like, how when he won, the first person he wanted was Tigress. And they just like held each other and that was really beautiful and i think their relationship was great and again i love the actress's voice it's just oh i love it it was so soothing and i think it shows how much sympathy she has and how she understands that tributes are also humans but in the book when we finish she has no there's no inkling of oh there's something wrong like she's so happy he's back she's so happy for grateful for the plant family and all of that like there's no bad blood or anything. Whereas in the movie, she says, oh, you remind me of your father, which she before said all when she saw his father, all she saw was hatred. Essentially, she's saying she sees beyond his facade and sees what he's done. And to her, I think it's also she's, she saw him as he was before as well, because he was pure, he was kinder. And now she sees that his, he's made that cross over to evil, like, Lucy Gray said, we're born pure and then we kind of choose and circumstances push us. I like that there's that seed of doubt at the end and you're like, oh, I think she's catching on because it just makes it a bit smoother of a transition to where she is with Hunger Games because I, when I, first time I read the book, I remember thinking like, oh, we're totally going to learn how Tigress and Snow fell out and what that relationship was like and we end the book with her still really loving and believing her little cousin so i felt very jarring to where she ended up in 65 years which obviously a long long time so a lot can happen but i like that this kind of set it up and kind of maybe answered that this is when the seeds of doubt were sown overall i think something that they really did a good job with is nods to the hunger games but not making it so cringy or obvious or very over the top i feel like there was a world where it was like oh katniss wink 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 and like oh my god the hanging tree let me play it every five seconds whereas they did it super tactfully where you really still enjoy it and you're like oh my god that's a not like when they say that it's still too early for katniss um and you're like oh my god the double meanings and when they say katniss and there's like weird eerie music playing and to me Snow's reaction was almost like he felt like destiny breathe down his neck and he just felt something off. Um, so I really liked that. But again, it was pretty subtle, like hungry, the hanging tree uh, song. 
I love, like how it was a bit understated and it was just in that one scene. It wasn't like hacked on that, oh my God, it's the song from Hunger Games, you know? So I really love that. Overall, the movie was just such a delight. A big Hunger Games fan. I think the books are scarily relevant and they become more relevant by the day, it feels like. And Suzanne Collins is an author. With dystopia, I think you have to have something to say. Uh, you only write dystopia well if you have something to say and she had something to say and she said it so eloquently and I feel like for a while probably we were all like oh my god Hunger Games just like first Hunger Games amazing and then Love Triangle and then you're like oh Hunger Games for kids like and then you read it as an adult and you are like wow there's so many themes of war and human nature and sacrifice and um, evil versus good and and it's overwhelmingly accurate and relevant and i think book one is also very relevant the prequel is also very relevant because to me snow was not evil from the get-go he wasn't born a little like vicious dictator um he went through incredible trauma he struggled a lot he saw the worst of humanity and he was re-traumatized by being you know put into games and made plaything of adults that maybe should have guided him like dr gall and dean highbottom i understand dean highbottom hates him because of his father but you know all, that could not have been good either because then you grow up with this antagon antagonistic adult figure who you feel like is out to get you and maybe then you latch on more into people like dr gall because she's on your side and I have a lot of sympathy for it but I don't think it's an excuse for what he does because he is shown kindness time and time again from people in his life like Tigress, like Ma, like I forgot to talk about Ma and, and Plinth family, I wish they were a slightly bigger part of it, I wish we met Ma more because I feel like Ma is just such a weird character with you know how she's district and how people treat her but then the kindness and you can see what having that maternal figure did for Sejanus and his kindness and how she treats snow and how kind she's to him and how you know her, her cookies and all that and i feel like again snow just has the opportunity to chose the right thing he has the opportunity to run away with woman he thinks he loves he has the opportunity to help out his friend and help him make a difference or escape and probably no one would have maybe people would have catch on that he's his friend but you know maybe they wouldn't have but he chooses self-preservation every time and on top of the self-preservation he chooses power and he chooses the wrong mentors like dr gall instead of sticking to someone like i don't know mass kindness or tigress's kindness or um or lucy gray's kindness and the copy how they could take care of each other like he could have had a happy life, he could have been part of the rebellion, you know, but even if that wasn't a card, he could have run away with Lucy Gwynn, perhaps, you know, swam in the lake and had a great time, or maybe he could have been content being a peacekeeper in 12 and still have some kind of relationship, but he didn't, he didn't want that, because he had this legacy to live up to, the legacy of being a snow, and the power that he was denied because his family fortune was taken away, he wanted to get that back. So every time he could choose the good thing or the right thing, he chose the selfish thing, the wrong thing. So I think that's just such a complex villain because it's not just he's born bad, therefore he's bad, or like he's also not born, or when we meet him, he's not super pure good, just like the most amazing person on earth and somehow he turns because you know a girl like spurred him like he has those narcissistic selfish tendencies which is i think normal if you grow up with a high status in a high status family but then also you're taking that away and he has this complex about Sejanus being more rich than him but he's from district two and he's also taught by his grandma that district people are not people they're animals so all of that definitely contributes to him, his worldview and how he grew up and the decisions he make. But he's met with kindness many, many times and he does not re reciprocate it. And people love him and trust him so much. Like Lucy Gray gave him his trust and she says the trust is the most important thing. 
and Sejanus, he thought of Snow as a brother. Like you could have a brother and you could have this best friend that you actually could have a good relationship with because of your cap all of your capital friends you've been keeping at a distance because you don't want them to know that you're poor. And he just every time he takes the wrong the other route, which is the route of power and choosing himself. So I think it's a brilliant book. It's a great movie. I had a great time with it. Uh, me and the friend I saw this with were talking about our ranking of all the Hunger Games movies. So I'm going to tell you mine and I want to hear down in the comments what yours is. So I would say for me in the fifth place would be Mockingjay Part 2. Recently rewatched, I had a little on the boring side and also weirdly fast. Mockingjay Part 1, a really good movie well paced i missed Peter in it and i just love the other ones then i would probably say hunger games the original one i think it set up the thing so beautifully and i think maybe if the director of the second movie did the first movie it would have been my top but i do think the shaky cam is a little bit much so the movie just makes it like it's a little bit like budget but they still did a pretty good job then i would say probably Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. I think the cinematography, the costume, the performances, amazing. Slightly on the long side and a lot happens, but that's just what it is. And then I think my number one would be Catching Fire. I think it's just such a good movie. Honestly, the aspect change ratio as she goes up on the platform and Cinna has been beaten and the scene at the lake where they her and pizza kiss and games and how they're set up and like how they brought Suzanne Collins's um, vision to life unbeatable let me know have you watched the new uh movie prequel movie if you did what did you think about it do you agree with my choices do, uh, my comments do you agree with what i said let me know do you think i'm wrong about something did you not like it did you not read the book but watch the movie and you're like Eh? let me know i just want to know all of your thoughts sorry this was so long but i just felt like talking and talking because this is a fun topic all right thank you so much for watching i really hope you enjoyed this video if you did if you could like comment and subscribe i really 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 appreciate it it really helps me out but that's it for me and i'll see you in my next one bye